Hello, everyone. Welcome back to Computer Science 3200. Um, today we have a really cool lecture. Um, we are going to be basically introducing all of the terminology that we will use for the rest of the course. So um, it's going to be a little bit dense, but don't worry. You have the slides, you have the video, you can rewatch it. Um, there's a lot of uh, a lot of a lot of information here. But uh, it should be pretty intuitive, and you should be able to uh, to take it in no problem. And I, for all of those of you out there who are like, oh, I want to know what's on the exam, I guarantee you there will be at least one question on each of the exams from this lecture because it it does cover a lot of the terminology um, that we will be using throughout the term. So uh, let's jump right into it, shall we? All right, so lecture number two, agents, actions, and environments. This is what it's all about. All right, first, before we get started, again, a little bit of a note that this is the most dense lecture of the course. We're going to be covering lots of definitions, lots of terminology, but it's good to get that out of the way up front because literally the entire rest of the course depends on us knowing these things. Don't worry if you don't understand everything. Completely, if you watch it the first time, we'll be talking about these things more and more as the, as the term goes on. And things will be iterated again later uh, in future lectures. And so use these slides as a reference going forward for the rest of the course, okay? Um, so we'll give all the definitions, we'll talk about them. Like I said, most of them should be pretty intuitive. Um, some of the calculations, some of the terminology might be new to you, but I'm sure you'll, you'll understand it no problem. All right, so let's get started. First of all, what is an agent in the terms of artificial intelligence or this course at the very least? So an agent is something that exists in a specific environment. Like I am an agent in the real world, okay? An agent is the entity for which we want to make decisions and take actions. So artificial intelligence is all about decision making. The output of the algorithms that we learn in this course will be decisions that agents are going to take. So in most cases, the environment is going to define a problem and the agent is going to define a solution. And there are many, many, many different types of agents. So for example, here we have a Roomba, right? So this Roomba is an agent. It's a thing that takes decisions within an environment. And here the environment is a hallway in a home, right? You could put the Roomba outside. It might get a little bit dirty. Um, but the environment here would be the house that this Roomba is in and the agent is the Roomba itself. Here we have another example of an agent and this is Spot, the robotic dog from Boston Dynamics. I know it has been updated a bit since these slides were made, but here it is solving a problem which is navigating indoors and it has to open a door and so it's making some decisions. Uh, here is another example of an agent. And this is called uh, the balance cart problem. We'll talk about this a little bit later. But in this problem, it's sort of a canonical problem in reinforcement learning, and we'll get to that in the second half of the course. But picture you have the pole balancing on your hand or balancing on a cart, and your actions are move to the left or move to the right. And you're trying to balance this pole for as long as possible. So in this case, the agent is the cart that you're trying to move. Uh, if you're playing... Um, uh, a board game like chess, then the agent is going to be the player. So you may think that the agent, oh, maybe the agent is the individual piece. No, in this case, it's the, it's the thing that's making the decisions, which is the player. And we'll find that throughout the course, we'll see that what the agent is depends on the problem, right? So for example, um, you know, as we're playing the game, maybe the agent here is Mega Man. But if we're writing an AI system, Whatever the thing is that we're trying to control and make decisions for, like for example, we could be trying to write an AI for this dragon chasing after Mega Man, maybe that is the agent, okay? So the agent depends on the problem and the problem specification. So how do these two things fit together? An agent within an environment will take actions to achieve a particular goal. So the agent is given some goal, how it gets that goal, we're not sure yet. 
But that might be get to the end of the maze, get the most points, whatever. It has an environment, it has a goal, and it has to take actions to achieve that goal. The agent is going to perceive its environment somehow. So there's an environment around it. What sort of information does it get about its environment? That's called, it's going to perceive its environment. And based on those perceptions of the environment, it's going to try and make a decision about what action to take. It's going to take its action. And then the taking of that action changes the environment somehow and the process repeats, right? So for example, I'm going to perceive my environment. Maybe I hear my phone ringing, right? So the action I'm going to take is to answer my phone. The environment is going to change because now my phone is in a different location, right? Maybe I'm talking to someone. And so the environment has changed. Now I make another perception about my environment. Maybe the phone call is over. The other person has said goodbye. And so I take my action, which is to put my phone away. Right? I know that's a trivial example, but actions change the environment, then we make new perceptions about the environment, and then the whole process repeats until some goal has been achieved. Artificial intelligence, I know we talked about there's no goal in mind, like, sorry, there's no strict definition for artificial intelligence, but within this definition, we can start to narrow the definition a little bit. And so I'm gonna say that artificial intelligence in the context of this course is the algorithmic discipline of making these decisions more intelligent. Okay, so you're trying to come up with better and better algorithms so that your decisions are more intelligent, meaning they achieve your goals better and better. So if we want to take this definition and look at it with like a diagram, here we have an environment, right? That could be me in my home, could be me in the universe, it could be um, outside like a cat or something like that. And we have an agent, so the agent will be the thing that we're trying to make decisions for. Uh, we make a decision for the agent. That agent takes that decision and performs the action that the decision um, said to make. That action is going to affect the environment somehow. The agent is then going to, after it's taken an action and maybe waited some arbitrary amount of time, whether it's a millisecond or an hour, is going to take a new observation of its environment to see how that action has changed the environment. And then the whole process is gonna repeat itself again. Based on that observation, we make a new decision, we take a new action, the action affects the environment, we perceive that change in the environment and we do a new action. So this is sort of the infinite loop in which we live, in which our agents live, in which our robots live, etc. Alrighty. Agents, how do they get the information about their environment? Well, they can get them in a bunch of different ways. So an agent is going to perceive its environment through some sort of sensors. Okay, so for example, if you have a robot, the robot might have a camera. Uh, it might have a laser rangefinder to tell you how far things are away. It might have sonar to tell distance or try and map the environment. Uh, humans have five senses, you know, depending on um, your physical state. You may be able to smell something that's close to you. You may be able to see something or hear something. All of that is a perception of the environment. When we talk about games, um, we may not actually use like physical sensors, right? We may just be given the state of the environment. Like for example, we may be just given a vector with all of the locations of things in the level. Or we may say, uh, tell this, this agent about the three closest things to it, right? So when you talk about physical things like a human or a robot, they are going to have sensors which actually read data from a physical environment. But once you get into like the virtual environment, you can basically give the agent whatever sort of information that you want, right? If we're playing uh, like a MOBA game like Dota or something and we want a Dota playing agent, we may only give it like the information that it should be able to see on the map and not the stuff that's hidden behind the fog of war. And an agent is going to act on its environment through actuators, right? So a robot might have wheels, it might have tracks, it might have arms. Um, it might have like some turny thingy or a laser or whatever. Humans have limbs, so I can pick up my phone, right? I can, this is a good excuse to take a drink. I can pick up this glass of water. I can drink the water with my mouth. Um, in games, we're going to have some sort of predefined rules or actions, right? So if you think about a game like chess, and trust me, you'll be sick of chess by the end of this uh, lecture, but it's a really good example. So a chess, you know, a pawn can move forward. 
a queen can move uh, up, down, left, right, or diagonal, etc. So those are the predefined actions and rules. So there won't be, again, in a virtual environment or in a game environment, there will not be physical actuators, right? Our AI won't necessarily have to pick up a physical chess piece, but it does have to know like the rules in order to make up or to, to take those actions in the game. <clears throat> and also, the agent may have some sort of knowledge about its environment. It may know the actions that are legal. It may know, so for example, again, if we play chess, it might know, hey, it's probably not a good idea to move this piece first, right? Or if you're playing StarCraft, for example, maybe you don't want to attack your own units. Maybe that's not very good. So we may have some knowledge about the environment um, or not. We may be just acting sort of at random, trying to observe what our actions do. So I talk about perception. And so a percept, the noun, a percept, is an agent's perceptual inputs at any instant. So if you could take a snapshot of your RAM, for example, um, that's the agent's current belief of the world. So that would be when we go on later to talk about a state and what a state of a game is or a state of an environment. A state of an environment is our current instantaneous belief about what the environment is. So for example, it's the, the pieces on a chessboard, how they are arranged right now, where the items in my room are, uh, the current velocity of my hand, etc. And that means that a percept sequence is the complete history of everything the agent has perceived so far, okay? So the percept is the instantaneous knowledge or belief uh, about an environment um, because our beliefs may be fuzzy. We may only be 30% certain that we see that car coming toward us. And the percept sequence is actually the sequence of events so far that we have perceived, okay? So in general, an agent's choice of action at any given instant can depend on the entire percept sequence to date. So that means that your best possible action to take right now may depend on a history of things that you've observed. Okay? It might. Um, in this course, we are only going to be looking at problems where the current state of the environment is sufficient to decide. Okay, so we have fully observable states and no state history is required. And we'll talk about the difference between these in a, in a second. I'll give a couple of examples. So the agent's behavior then is going to be given by the agent function. So there's no one agent function. This is the function or the software system that we use that's sort of the AI system, right? So whenever someone tells you they have a system for AI, that's kind of the agent function. And what the agent function is, does is it maps or it takes as input a percept sequence and then as output it gives the action. So given what I've seen so far, take this action. That's what an agent's goal or sorry, that's what an agent's job is, is to once it's given a goal, um, it perceives its environment, uh, it takes an action and does that, um, that infinite loop that we were talking about. So here's an example. Here is a state of the environment. If I told you, okay, people in the chat, type out what you believe the state of that environment will be uh, one second in the future. So just type out what you think the state of this environment will be one second in the future. Just some short description of how it may change. I think I have the, the lecture set to normal latency instead of low latency, but that's okay. <clears throat> because I have the latency set, setting set a bit, um, there you go, okay. So someone said water splash. Someone said the person will be down. These are all great guesses, but all of those guesses, yeah, so some people say the person diving will be lower, uh, closer to the water. Um, they will be lower with a higher velocity. Okay, great. So what made you say that? What made you say that was a bunch of knowledge that you assumed applied to this picture, right? So as a human being, you have, you have your whole life learned a little bit about 
people falling from things, right? Um, what if, now I'm just saying, I'm just being devil's advocate here. What if this person, what if there's a trampoline down here and this person is actually on the way up, right? What if they're doing a backflip on the way up? What if they jumped from right here and they're currently on the way up, but they will go down? What if they came from this side? At, like, what if they got shot out of a moving airplane and they're going to hit the, you know, like, there's a lot of things that you assume when you see this. And those assumptions sometimes can be good and sometimes can be bad. So the point here is that if we are trying to, for example, um, make a decision in this case, we may actually want to have the entire history of actions up to this point, the percept sequence. So the sequence of perceptions, right? So if we have like all of these perceptions up to this point, then we could pretty easily predict what's going to happen and maybe take an action on that. But over here, even though we think we know what's going to happen, it's not so clear, right? So in some problems, and in actually in most problems in the real world, we do need to have this sort of history of things that have happened. However, in this course, th that becomes a very difficult problem. So in this course, we are going to be working on problems that do not require a complete history. So for example, um, in a game of chess, it is sufficient to just look at the board and you can make the best possible decision based on what the pieces are on the board. You don't need to know the history of moves. You don't need to know anything else for a game of chess other than the pieces that are on the board. And that is provable. And we'll talk about that as we go through the course. So now, okay, the only thing about a game of chess is there's this rule at the end where if you make the same move 50 times in a row, it's a draw. So you don't know the number of those moves. But okay, that thing aside, right? And whatever the clock timer is, just assume you have infinite time. Chess... You can look at the board and you can 100% decide on the best move, unlike in this case where you need to have other information, okay? So this course is going to decide on, on this situation. Okay, no. Here's a situation that came up years ago in uh, the LCS in, in League of Legends. So if anyone out there knows League of Legends, you'll know that this is the Baron. And so this is a game between the old Team Liquid and TSM teams. And so the Baron is this boss that spawns on the map. And if you get the last killing blow, so if you deal the last one hit point of damage to this enemy, you get a ton of money, you get good buffs. And so it's, it's a really good thing. You want to get that, um, that Baron kill. Uh, a bunch of people in the chat are talking about League of Legends now. That's good. Um, so yeah, like what you have to do is you have to time your abilities so that they hit the lot, like they hit the Baron. Now, here's what happened here. Uh, the blue team has been killing the Baron. They've done all the work and the red team here, there's one person from the red team. The rest of his team is dead. He's trying to deal the last point of damage to get all of that, uh, to not only get it for his team, but steal it from the other team. And it looks pretty easy. He just walks up and fires something, right? But here is the viewpoint from this player. This is the viewpoint of the observer who can see the whole map. This is the viewpoint of the person who stole the kill. They actually could not see any details about the Baron, its current health, etc. All that that person had to go on was the history up to that point. So this person, you know, they're a very talented player. They did a bunch of calculations in their head, like, okay, um, they engaged the Baron about 30 seconds ago. I think that it'll take them about 30 seconds to deal this amount of damage. So when I think the time is up, I'll fire this thing and I'll hope to hit it, right? There is no way that given just that single state observation, they would be able to make um, that decision to kill the Baron. They needed a sequence of perceptions of that environment in order to take that action. So again, in this course, we will be simplifying things dramatically to not include situations like this. And you'll thank me for that later. <clears throat> okay. So we talked about agents. Let's drill down into what an action is. So an action taken by an agent in a given state transitions the state into another state. So remember how we said that actions change the environment? 
And so an action is going to take our, the current state, so the current instantaneous state, and transition that to another state. And also in this course, we're going to be dealing with discrete time steps. And so it'll be like time one, time two, time three, like moves on a chessboard, right? So we're not talking about like real life, okay, are we dealing with one millisecond later? Or are we dealing with one second later? In this course, we're gonna be dealing with, there is one time step, there's one state, and then we take an action and then there's another state. So just think of a chessboard. So hopefully you have seen state transition tables and state diagrams before, but this is, you know, this might be on an exam. Um, this is the state transition, this is the state diagram for this state transition table. So what this means here is we have two possible actions, action one or action zero, and we have two states, state one and state two. So this table gives us the exact same information as this diagram, and what it does is it says it maps out the entire rules of this environment, right? So how states transition from one to another. So here you have, it says, if you are in state one and you do action one, stay in state one. However, if you do action zero, switch to state two, okay? So if you're in state one and you take action one, you stay in state one. And if you take action zero, you move to state two. If you are in state two and you take action one, you stay in state two. And if you're in state two and you take action zero, you move to state one. So if we had to give some sort of names to this, let's say like this environment is me standing in one location. And the, the environment has two states, me standing right here or me standing over there. So state uh, action one seems to be the action stay where you are and action zero seems to be change places, right? So if I change, if I choose action zero, I'm going to change to the other state. If I choose action one, I'm going to stay in the same state. Right? So that is a state transition table and a state diagram. And of course, this is one of the simplest possible cases with only two states and two actions, but there could be any number of states and any number of actions. So that state, right? States transition to other states based on actions. And that is handled by the state transition function, STF. So we're not gonna talk a lot about specifically about a state transition function but it's also called a successor function. And this could be a completely arbitrary function. It could be a table, it could be a graph, right? So in this case, this is a very simple example. This state transition function can be represented by either a table or by a graph, or you could think of yourself writing a very simple function to do this, right? However, if you had a game like Super Mario Brothers, right? there's no way you could possibly encapsulate every possible state of Super Mario Brothers in a table. So in that case, you would have a successor function, meaning given the current state of the game of Mario, if the player presses the A button and is holding left, what is the next state of the game? What's gonna be on the next frame of the game? That's the state um, successor function. So the state transition function or STF, as input is going to take the current state of the game or the environment and an action and then produce the next state, right? So this is, if it's in a video game, it's maybe, you know, one frame of the game later. If this is a game like chess, then the STF would implement the rules of the game of chess. So if you had a current state of a chessboard and an action like move the pawn up by one, then this would be the resulting state where the pawn has been moved up by one. Here's an example uh, for the game of Connect Four. So here's the current state of the game at, at whatever state. Um, then we're gonna take an action as the yellow player to drop a piece down here. And so the resulting state S prime is the state where we have dropped the yellow piece down into that column. Similarly in chess, we can take a move by moving a piece. There you go, that's an action. An action in a video game, such as a fighting game, might be more complex. Right here, a player is taking a sequence of actions, but each actual button press does something inside the engine. Here's a professional StarCraft player with their many, many, many actions per minute. Here's a human being taking an action, right? Doing a jumping jack is taking an action.
So now we know what an action is. Um, let's move a little bit further on with the definition. You have to excuse me. I just gave like a two and a half hour lecture for my previous class. So I'm going to need the, the weekend for my voice to recover. Okay. Policies. A policy is something you may have heard of in real life before. You might have like an insurance policy. And so what insurance policy states is that if you are ever in this scenario, here's what's going to happen, right? And that's essentially what a policy is in our course as well. So a policy is going to tell us if you're ever in this state, here's the action that you should do, okay? So a policy is a mapping from states to actions. And so we're going to represent policy by the symbol pi. Excuse my horrible PowerPoint font. This is actually pi, the Greek symbol, 3.14. Um, so policy is going to be represented by the symbol pi. And if we have an optimal policy, and we'll talk about optimal policies a lot later, um, but essentially that's the best possible thing you could do, that we're going to say is pi star. So pi star is the optimal policy. So if we have a policy pi, and we pass as an input to that policy a state, it's going to give us the action that we should do at that state, right? So given that we are in state S, do action A. That's what the policy states. The policy could be implemented in a number of different ways. So it could be a very simple lookup table, right? It could be a bunch of if statements. It could be an arbitrary function calculation that runs some complex search algorithm. It could be a neural network. We'll talk about that later. And so the policy is some sort of way of mapping states to actions. Here's an example of a policy, and we'll do, uh, we're actually doing this in one of our assignments. So in this policy, the agent here is the red dot, and the goals that the agent is trying to get to are these green squares, and the dark gray are walls that it can't move through. So what this policy says is that if you are at any of these given locations, the arrows are pointing to which direction you should go to in order to get to the goal the fastest. So for example, if the agent is right here, it should move down. But if the agent is here, well then moving right or down is equally as good. It will get you to something the fastest, right? Actually in this spot, if you move up, down, left, or right, you are actually getting equally close to a goal. So this is one sort of policy for specifically for grid pathfinding, that's very easy to, um, to be intuitive about. You can understand what that is exactly saying. Here's another example of a policy. This is a blackjack betting table. We may get into this later in the course. So it says that for any given state in the environment, right? So remember in here, the environment is represented um, using like Cartesian coordinates. So it's a physical space. So this is easy to understand. But over here, the table says, if you have this card, or if you have this sum, and the dealer has this card showing, here's the action that you should take. So this again, this is a policy. It's saying for every possible state, what action should we take? And this is an optimal policy for blackjack. So if you were allowed to walk into a casino with this, you would be playing blackjack as well as any human being could play blackjack. And they probably don't want you to do that, but it turns out that even if you're playing blackjack optimally, you're still losing about 2% of your money over time. So you shouldn't play blackjack. All right. Here's another example of a policy. This is a flowchart policy. So you've probably seen these before online, and I like this one. This, uh, this is a policy for determining whether or not you should worry about a given situation in your life. So here's the flowchart. Do you have a problem? No. Okay, well, if you don't have a problem, you don't have to worry, right? Do you have a problem? Yes. Can you do something about it? Yes. Well, if you can do something about it, you should do it, and so you don't have to worry. And if you can't do something about it, then you can't worry because you can't do anything about it, right? So the whole point here is never worry. It doesn't do anything for you. So I know it's a lot easier said than done, but it's just a fun example of a, um, of a flowchart policy. All right, on to our next definition. Rationality. What is rationality? You've probably heard of someone saying that they're rational or irrational. This has nothing to do with numerical rationality, but here's the definition. 
A rational agent is the one that does the optimal action for each possible state, given what it knows. Okay? So a rational agent will look at all the available information, and somehow it will take the optimal action. Now, we talked about actions, but what is an optimal action? Well, an optimal action is the one that makes the agent the most successful toward reaching its goal. Okay? So what does most successful mean? Well, I know that you might think I'm getting really like, um, like semantic and stuff with these definitions, but it really does matter. So in order to define what the most successful thing is, we must define a performance measure. So we have to come up with a numerical measure of performance for an agent before we can decide what a good action or a bad action even is. So the performance measure is going to measure how successful the agent has been. And so if the rational agent does the optimal thing for every possible state, then by, de by definition, the rational agent has an optimal policy, okay? And it's optimal within its level of knowledge. Meaning that like, and we'll talk about this a bit later, but a rational agent can only do the best it knows with a given information, right? And, and I'll give you an example of that later. So, okay, what is this performance measure then? Let's drill down into that. It's the criteria for success of an agent. It can also be called an evaluation function. So here's a typical scenario. An agent is placed in an environment. That agent is going to perform a sequence of actions. The actions cause the environment to go through a sequence of states. And if the sequence of states is desirable, the agent has performed well and the evaluation is higher, right? So whatever our goal is for our agent, we desire the agent to come closer to that goal. And so our evaluation function has to reflect that somehow. So for example, the easiest possible evaluation function in all of video games is move right. <laughs> you know, like this has been the classical example of video game evaluation for almost since video games have, have come out. So there's, there's like get the most points or move to the right. So here's Flappy Bird. And we have a very well-defined performance measure for Flappy Bird. And that would just be the X location of the bird. Or I guess more accurately for Flappy Bird, the number of pipes that the bird has flown through. Okay. So that moving to the, like how far have we gone? That is the goal in Flappy Bird. And so our performance measure is how far have we gone? In some other problem, we may want to measure um, not how far we've gone, but actually kind of the opposite. So if we have a starting location and a goal location, what is the shortest possible path to, to get to that goal? So our performance measure may be um, minimizing the distance traveled, right? If we want the shortest path, then our performance measure is distance and our goal is to minimize that distance. In the cart balancing problem, the amount of time that the pole has been balanced that is our performance measure, okay? And in some, in other games, it may actually be really difficult to come up with a performance measure. We're going to talk about this more when we get to this section of the course when we talk about minimax search and alpha beta. But in the end, there is one performance measure that very strictly defines how good you are at a game, and that's whether or not you won, okay? Oh, I just lost the game. All right, I won't... I won't get into that, but if you know, you know. All right. So, rationality. Rationality depends on four things. The four things are, this, is, this makes for a good exam question, by the way, wink, wink. Um, the performance measure that defines success. Okay, so you, got, you need the performance measure. The agent's prior knowledge of the environment, what they knew about the environment. The actions the agent can perform. Okay, what actions can it do in the environment? That's sort of the rules of the game. And the agent's percept sequence. So what has it observed about the game so far? And I say game, but I mean environment, I mean real life, whatever. Okay, so we just talked about rationality, but I said that rational agents do the best with the knowledge they have. So rationality is not 
omniscience, okay? So what does omniscience mean? So an omniscient agent is kind of like a, a god would be omniscient, right? It would know the outcome of actions. So for example, there might be um, in, well, let's use League of Legends again. You might have some chance to critically hit, right? And so let's say the opponent is at 100 hit points. Uh, a normal attack will do 50, but a crit will do 100. And so if you knew whether or not you're going to crit, you would probably tower dive to get that last hit, right? But you don't know that. You might only have a 1% chance to crit. And so a rational agent might not go for the kill because it, it thinks the probability is too low, and that's fine. But an omniscient agent might know, okay, it's going. you're going to get that 1% chance, therefore you should go for the kill. Um, it knows the outcome of randomness. So... For example, if an omniscient player is playing Monopoly, it will know the dice roll, right? So it could base all of its actions knowing the sequence of dice rolls to the end of the game. But a rational agent does not know this sort of thing. A rational agent can only make observations and take actions based on that. A, an omniscient agent might also know the entire actual state of the environment, even the unobservable things. Right? So for example, if you're playing StarCraft, an omniscient agent would know where all of the opponent's units are, but a rational agent would not necessarily know that. Here's an example. If someone came up to you, and let's pretend that you thought they were an honest person, right? They're obviously, if this happened in the street, you'd know there was some sort of trick. But let's say that you know this person is, um, is honest. They bet you, they come up with a six-sided die, right? A normal die, and they say, I'm going to bet you a hundred dollars, or sorry. Um, yeah, I'm going to bet a hundred dollars that this won't be a six. Right? The person's going to take that bet because there's a five out of six chance that they double their money, right? But then when the die is actually roll, it's a six and the person loses the money. So too many people in life, this is sort of a life lesson that I, I really hate how society acts on this. But like in society, in the real world, what happens is people judge the intelligence of a decision based on the outcome right? So some football player goes for a Hail Mary pass that's only going to like go, it's only going to be caught one out of a thousand times, but they got lucky and got the catch and they're a hero. They're not a hero. They're still a fool. They just got lucky. That's not the smart play, right? The smart play is the thing that has the highest expected value. So if you took this bet, you would still be a smart, rational agent, but you were not omniscient. You didn't know that you were going to lose because of bad luck, okay? So that bet was still rational because the expected value, we'll get into expected value later, but the expected value of that bet was greater than one. Therefore, it was a smart move. Alrighty. Environments. We've been saying a lot about environments and like hand-waving over it. We kind of know what an environment is, but let's define an environment. So... The environment of the task is going to define our problem, right? The properties of the environment define the problem. So, for example, design an agent to be the best chess player. Well, the environment is chess, and the properties of the chess, envi of the chess environment are going to define the problem, and then we are going to decide an agent, a rational agent, that plays the game of chess, and that is the solution to the problem. So the specification and the properties of the environment greatly impact the design of a rational agent to work within it. And what this means is that there are certain properties of environments that make it so you actually can or cannot choose a particular algorithm and apply a solution to that problem, okay? So there are certain algorithms that work when there's randomness. There's certain algorithms that don't work when there's randomness. There's certain algorithms that work in real-time environments, but not in discrete environments, okay? And we'll talk about this, but it's very important. If someone says, give me a solution to this problem, well, you've got to know all the, pro the properties of the environment before you can choose an algorithm. 
And again, a state that we talked about is a particular configuration of a given environment at one instant in time. Okay, so here's the environment that you're gonna get sick of, chess. The environment is defined by the board, right? That pieces can go on, the number and type of pieces that can go onto the board, also the rules and the boundaries of the game itself, how pieces are captured, the type of legal action, so for example, bishop can only move diagonally, horse moves in an L, whatever, I call it a horse, oh my god, it's a knight. Um, the starting state of a game of chess, and the goal condition of a state, right? So, there's also a starting state. So for example, in chess, here is the starting state for a game of chess. White moves first in the game of chess. Here is a particular state of the game of chess. This is a state over here. This is a state of chess. This is a state of chess. They are different states. What sequence of actions brought us to this state from this state? We don't exactly know, but that's not important right now. Um, in chess, an agent can observe the entire environment of a game of chess. So, environments are going to be defined by several properties Okay, and we'll go into some of those properties now. One of them is the observability. So agent observation and how that relates to the state of the environment. For the agent, the state of the environment is based on an observation that it can make, right? So the state is sort of what it can see. Now, the environment might have other things in it, but to the agent, the state is the belief of the, of the state not the actual state. So it's what it can see. That observation may or may not be a complete representation of the environment's actual physical state, right? So if you go out into the world, you are an agent, you look left and right when you cross the road, you don't see any car coming, you take a step, turns out there was a car going 120 right behind that ridge, you're still a rational agent because you didn't see that car coming, right? Okay, so the agent's observation is all that it can use to make a decision. So if there's other stuff, then it can't know about that other stuff, right? It can only make a decision based on what it's either told or what it can see. So an example of this is a driving environment, right? You as a human being, you have a certain amount of knowledge about like how fast cars go, how quickly you can turn, um, what kind of psychos are out on the road that day, the, the weather conditions, all sorts of stuff. You cannot observe everything. You may not know how many people are in that car or exactly the speed that it's going or what's right around the bend, but you as a rational, perfect driver that you are, are going to make decisions based on what you can observe and sort of not worry about the things that you can't observe. And this is what robots try to do, right? So if you took like, a snapshot at like this is a move this is a, a movie file but if you took an image of this then that would be the agent's state at any given time the agent might have some cameras uh, here it looks to be it has maybe it has some laser range finders or something and so at any given time it has a uh, a belief of the current state of the environment that it's in okay we know what a state is we know what an action is. Let's talk about the state and action space now. All right. So the state space of an environment, that's the number of possible configurations of the environment for a given problem. So what that does is it lets us say, how many possible games of chess are there? Why do we want to know that? Well, we'll get into that a bit later. The action space is the number of actions possible from a given state. And this is usually given either as an average case or a worst case. So for example, in the game of chess, um, you have approximately on average 50 different possible moves that you could make at any given time. If you are behind the wheel of a car, well, let's say you're driving an automatic, your, essentially your decisions are how much do I press or release the gas? How much do I press or release the brake? And what is the angle of turning that I'm going to apply, right? And state and action spaces are going to be used as an estimation of complexity. So what is the complexity of a problem that I'm trying to solve? 
So here's a nice little movie. I got it from up here. Um, you can check the URL on the slides. Here is estimating the state space complexity of the game Tic-Tac-Toe. So in Tic-Tac-Toe, there are three possible values at any space on the board, either X, O, or blank. And on the board, there are nine possible locations, okay? So for every location, there's three possibilities. Three to the power of nine is approximately 10 to the power of four, okay? So there's a few thousand states in state space complex, uh, in, in tic-tac-toe. So we, we usually work in orders of magnitude. So for tic-tac-toe, we say that the state complexity is approximately 10 to the power of four. Some people say four, right? So that's the state space complexity. Now, why do we care about the state space complexity? Well, what it lets us know is whether or not a problem is trivially solvable. And what do I mean by trivially solvable? What I mean by that is if the number of possible states, so if the state space is so small that a computer could trivially enumerate all of them and then just select the best action, then that is pretty trivially solvable. And so if we have even 10,000 here, which is more than this, a few thousand possible tic-tac-toe boards, and with symmetries, it's actually just like 250. So if we only have a few thousand possible, um, possible boards, we could just write a computer program to take every possible action at every possible state and then see what the best move is. So this is not, so, so what we've shown is that tic-tac-toe is not a very complex problem and any second year computer science student can easily solve tic-tac-toe. Okay. Someone asked, wouldn't the game have already ended before many of these states can be reached? That's true. However, what we're doing here is we're giving an upper bound on the maximum possible state space, not the average state space. But that's, that's a really good question. So in some of these cases, like three to the power of nine is an overestimation because you can't have like the whole board be X's, right? So there's, there are fewer than this amount, but we're just giving the upper bound to show you that, okay, even with the upper bound, it's so easily solvable. That's not an interesting game. Let's look at chess. This is going to go by pretty quickly. You don't need to understand all of these, but this is a rough estimation of the number of possible states of a game of chess. It is very large, okay? I'm not gonna say all the different things, you can watch the video back, but it is approximately 10 to the power of 43. That's pretty big. Um, we cannot currently perform 10 to the power of 43 operations. It's too big. All right, let's just leave it at that for now and I'll, I'll give some analogies in a bit. Here's the board game of Go. So let's do the state space calculation. Each spot on a Go board can be blank, black, or white. A Go board has 19 rows and 19 columns, which is 361 spaces. Three to the power of 361 is approximately 10 to the power of 172, which is an insane, an insane number, okay? So let's look at, at this again. Tic-tac-toe has approximately 10,000 as its state as its state space. I'm not even going to say these numbers, but 10 to the power of 43 for a game of chess and 10 to the power of 172 for go. Now, that's the number of possible states that the board can be in. However, the game tree complexity and we will we will revisit game tree complexity in another lecture, but essentially if this number is the number of possible configurations of an environment, this number is the number of possible sequences of actions that could get us to that configuration of the environment. If you think about it, for every possible state of the game of chess, there are way more, there, there's like, there are millions of possible ways that you could have gotten to that state. Right? So this is the number of states and this is the number of ways to achieve that state. It's called the game tree complexity and why it's called that we'll get to in another lecture. Needless to say, 
It's insanely large, okay? Um, someone just mentioned atoms in the universe in the chat. I will, I'm getting to that now, okay? So you've got five, you've got 123, you've got 360. Remember those numbers because we're about to make real world analogies to those. So 10 to the power of nine is the number of seconds in a century, okay? 10 to the 11 is the number of total humans born. 10 to the 17 is the age of the universe in seconds. 26 is the number of, sorry, is the diameter of the universe in meters. 10 to the 30 is the number of stars in the universe. 10 to the 80 is the number of atoms in the universe, okay? So chess, the number of possible board positions of chess is somewhere between the number of stars in the universe and the number of atoms in the universe, okay? Um, that's a very large number. 10 to the 172, however, is more than the number of protons we would need to fill the universe. So if, like, this is go, okay? So if every if every possible free space in the universe was occupied by a proton, which it isn't, and each of those protons was a supercomputer, we still could not compute every possible place on the board of a game of chess. So, yeah, it's a big number. So that might mean that the game is complex. I'll, I'll give you an example in a second. Starcraft. Starcraft, we have we computed in a paper that a lower, 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 lower bound of the number of possible games of Starcraft is 10 to the thousand. Like, it doesn't even matter how big it is anymore. The numbers are so big, it doesn't even matter, right? It's just way bigger. So, so what this tells us is that Go, Chess, Starcraft, we could not just write a program to enumerate the whole game and tell us the best answer. That, that's what this calculation tells us. So, important, very, very important. A large state space does not prove that a game is complex, but it is necessary to show that a game is complex, okay? And consider this. I'm not sure how many of you are familiar with the game of Go, but in the game of Go, you place pieces on a board until um, until you run out of pieces or until the board is full and you capture other players stones by surrounding them and then at the end of the game when you can no longer place stones um, the person with the most stones on the board wins okay but picture this variant of the game of go picture if you played go but there were no captures meaning that all that happened in the game of go is that one player placed a stone, then another player placed a stone, then the other, then the other, then the other, then the other. And you just alternate taking turns, placing pieces on the board. There are no captures in this version of Go. This version of Go is equally as complex in terms of state space complexity and game tree complexity as the original version of Go. However, since Go has an odd number of pieces on the board, if there are no captures, then we know and we could prove that whoever goes first, no matter how they place their stones, and no matter how the other person places their stones, the first player will always win, right? Doesn't matter what you do. So that game of no capture Go is equally as complex, but it's trivially solvable, okay? So these calculations don't mean that if the number is high, the game is very complex because we just showed an example where it wasn't, right? But it does mean that if the game is really high, if the number is really high, we can't solve it trivially, right? So every complex game has a high number, but not every game with a high number is complex, okay? All right. And that's what I just said. Alrighty, so the environment definition. If we want to specify on an exam an environment, which you probably will have to do, 
How would we do that? So the definition of an environment is the rules and dynamics that govern it. So if we're talking about the real world, maybe we have physics. If we're talking about chess, maybe we have the game rules. If we're talking about uh, Halo, maybe we have the input controller, whatever. We also need the legal actions that are allowed at any given state. So if you're right up against a wall in a maze, uh, can you move to, can you move into a wall? Can you teleport? What are the legal actions that you can do? What is the starting state and what is the goal state? So if we're talking about navigating from here to Cornerbrook, or like here is the initial state and the goal state is Cornerbrook, okay? The initial and goal states are usually given by a problem instance, meaning a specific problem in the environment. So for example, we may have a problem and an environment, which is like Google Maps, but a specific problem instance would be navigating from this specific point to this other specific point. And environments are going to be defined by their properties. And so now we're gonna get into um, the properties. Um, so someone just asked a good question. What's the difference between rules and legal actions? So you can possibly see the um, the game rules define the legal actions, I guess. So for example, in the game of chess, if you were to program the game of chess, you would have um, one function which says that, okay, if a piece moves from here to here, then that piece is captured and is no longer on the board. So that complex thing, that is a game rule. You might have another function which says, what is my set of legal actions at this time? And that would return, you can move uh, pawn A2 to A4. That's one legal action. Pawn A2 to A3, that's another legal action. So the game rules are the things that govern which actions are legal. Okay, so yeah, that's, that's not immediately clear, but it's a good question in order to sort of de define what the difference is. All right. So environments have many properties, and we're going to discuss these properties now. All right. So fully versus partially observable. Oh, someone else had another question. Just curious, but are these numbers provable? And if not, no, so they're provable. I, I mean, we showed the proof of those numbers in, in, the, um, in the slides. So they're provable. All right. So Fully versus partially observable. This is the first property of environments that we're going to talk about. What does fully observable mean? Fully observable environments mean that the agent's sensors give it access to the complete state of the environment at any given time. So you have the access to the relevant part of the state for actions. So for example, if this is a game and you read a, a game AI paper, these will be called perfect information games when you can see the entire state of the board. So chess, checkers, go, but StarCraft is not that, okay? League of Legends is not that. Counter-Strike is not that. Those are partially observable games. Some of the data is hidden or occluded from one or more of the agents in the games. Uh, you may also have um, something where the data is not intentionally occluded, but you have imperfect sensors, right? So in the real world, um, you know, your self-driving car, it has a laser rangefinder or a camera. Things may not intentionally be hidden, but your, your sensor is not perfect, right? So that is a partially observable environment. In games, they are called imperfect information games. So fully observable game would be something like um, chess or checkers, traditional board games. Monopoly is not fully absorb uh, observable because you have um, chance cards that are like shuffled, okay? So in Monopoly, there is some information that is hidden from players that is partially observable. In StarCraft, that's also partially observable because I can only see my units on the map. I cannot see my opponent's units if they're in the fog of war. So that's observability as a property. Um, deterministic versus stochastic. All right. Deterministic. Deterministic environments mean that the next state of the environment is entirely determined by the current state 
and the current action of the agent. There is no randomness in the environment. So in a deterministic environment, if I choose to move forward by one meter, I will always move forward by one meter, okay? In a stochastic environment, there is uncertainty about the outcome of actions. So for example, if I'm playing um, blackjack and I take the action of draw a card, right, or hit me, the outcome of that action is random because the cards have been shuffled and I will receive what is essentially, excuse me, a random card. If I'm playing backgammon or monopoly and I choose to roll dice, the, the action that I take was roll the dice, but the outcome of that action is stochastic. It's random. And think about that from the point of view of the agent. If the agent takes the action, if they are always 100% certain of the outcome of that action, then it's deterministic. Otherwise, it's stochastic. All right. So deterministic again, chess is deterministic. There are no portals or critical hits in chess, right? It's whatever you do, you're sure you're doing. And stochastic is pretty much any card game in which cards are dealt or you are drawn cards, okay? So the outcome of actions is uncertain. Episodic versus sequential. In an episodic task, agents, experiences, and actions are divided into atomic episodes. So an agent perceives the current state, takes an action, and the next episode does not depend on the previous whatsoever. It turns out that there are not a lot of problems that are episodic. Um, we'll show an example of one, but there aren't a lot of episodic problems. We are going to talk mostly about sequential problems. Sequential problems are where the current action can and usually does influence future decisions, right? So actions may have long-term consequences. So an, epic, an episodic problem is something like optical character recognition, right? So if I, if you give me an, an image of a number and I think, okay, with 70% probability, that's a three, um, nothing I've ever seen in the past really influences that decision, and that decision does not influence anything that I do in the future. However, with a sequential problem, like a game environment or a robotic environment, if you choose to move this knight to a particular spot, that is going to impact the rest of the game. So it's sequential. We have many actions in a row, okay? But this is one of the least interesting of the properties, in my opinion. Dynamic versus static is another property. In a dynamic um, setting, the environment may change while the agent is deciding. So this is kind of like the real world, right? The, the environment is constantly just asking the agent, what are you going to do? 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 And so if you're driving, right, and there's a wall in front of you, there's no turn-based driving, right? You don't get to sit there and think for five minutes. The environment is changing while you are thinking. So in dynamic environments, you have to think quickly. In static environments, the environment only changes when the agent says, I'm ready, here's an action. And so decision-making time doesn't matter. And so if we're thinking about games, these are real-time games versus turn-based games. And again, the easy example, dynamic StarCraft, right? The agent is sitting there trying to make decisions, and meanwhile, I got Zergling rushed. The game doesn't care how long you take to make decisions. That's just the game, right? It's dynamic. It's going to keep going whether or not you are taking actions. In a static environment, the game is just sitting there. You are playing chess by mail. Your opponent cannot take a move until you take a move. Now, I know this changes a little bit when you get timers and stuff like that. But for the most part, chess itself without timers is a static game. Next, we have discrete versus continuous. So this distinction is applied to the state of the environment and usually determines the way that time is handled. Okay, so in discrete settings, there are a finite number of distinct states. Again, like chess, there's one state, one state, one state, and we have a discrete set of percepts and actions. In a continuous environment, you have continuous time, you have continuous actions. So again, um, a discrete environment would, some, would be something like a card game. 
So I, I play a card, then you play a card, then I play a card, then you play a card. We're playing blackjack, it's hit me, hit me, stick, dealer bust, whatever. In a continuous environment, this usually applies to things like robotics, where time, you know, okay, let's not get into the philosophical debate about whether at the minuscule level time is finite or infinite or discrete, right? We're just going to say that the real world is continuous. So, um, the real world driving problem, that's a pretty continuous problem. We could also sort of think of some video games as continuous problems. Like if you're playing Counter-Strike and it's like you're playing at 300 tick rate, so you've got like 300 frames per second, you know, you can almost think of that as continuous. And certain video games are continuous enough that what certain algorithms do is they say, okay, we're gonna break the game down into discrete time steps, right? So for example, when you have a continuous time problem like this, you will probably have to say something like, okay, our vehicle will only make one decision every 10 milliseconds because it can't make infinitely fast decisions. Now, the only, the only exception to that is if you have an analog computer, you can make infinitely many quickly decisions. Analog computers are pretty amazing, but outside of analog computing, which we're not talking about in this course, you have to discretize a continuous space in order for an algorithm to make some sort of decision. All right. Next, we have the number of agents in the game. Single agent versus multi-agent. Single agent, for example, uh, a puzzle game, right? So you have one agent acting at a time. If you're trying to do a Sudoku or you're trying to solve a maze, that is a single agent problem. If you have a multi-agent problem, then multiple agents are acting together. That could either be cooperative or competitive. So for example, here you have a pathfinding problem. This is a single agent problem. I'm trying to get from here to here. Now there are multi-agent pathfinding things, so I know that's a bit of, bit of a weird example, but for the most part, pathfinding is a single agent thing. Over here, we have a multi-agent problem where we have two teams with five agents per team. Five of these agents are cooperating, five of these agents are cooperating, and the teams are going, going at it, right? So um, they're competitive. So the number of agents matters as well. Specific algorithms are only apl applicable to single agent problems, to multi-agent problems, and certain, a certain algorithms are only applicable in competitive environments and certain are only apl applicable in cooperative environments. So we'll get into that later. Next, we have complete versus incomplete information. In, in a complete information, this is not observability. It's different, okay? In the observability problem, complete observability meant we could see all the environment. In a complete information environment, we know all the game rules and all the physics, as well as all the possible actions. In an incomplete information environment, the game rules or physics may not be known to us. And so the actions may have to be discovered. So for example, in the real world, I would kind of say that that's an incomplete information. So not only is it partially observable, right? In so far that some of the things you can't see, but even the rules of the game may not be known to you, right? You may not know exactly what the physics of the game do. And so you may have to try actions in order to see what they do. All right, so I have this handy little table here at the end. Um, I will ask a question on these properties on the exam. There's always one, I'll choose a game or tell you to make up something. But what I've kind of done here is I've ordered games in terms of when you turn on or off these properties, each of the properties has like, um, if the property is on, it's usually much more difficult than if the property is off, right? So episodic game, um, we're not going to talk about episodic problems. They're not interesting. They're more machine vision stuff. So all of our pro all our games here are sequential, right? So if we think about, okay, what is a game that is sequential, but all of these other things, they're kind of turned off, right? So it's single agent, deterministic, fully observable, static, and discrete. 
Well, that might be a crossword puzzle. It might be a Sudoku, right? That's the type of thing we're talking about. Now, if we change the number of agents from a single agent game to a multi-agent game, now we have something like chess. So chess is a sequential, multi-agent, deterministic, fully observable, static, discrete environment, okay? Now, let's change from deterministic to stochastic. So backgammon, for example, is a game where it's sequential, multi-agent, but now it's stochastic with a fully observable, static, discrete environment. Now, let's turn the full observability of that game into partial observability. Now we'll hide some information. So we have poker. So poker has partial observability, but it's still static and it's still discrete, right? So let's turn the static into dynamic, and now we have a video game like StarCraft. So StarCraft is sequential, multi-agent, stochastic, partially observable, and dynamic, right? Remember what we talked about dynamic? The game is moving without you. But it's still discrete. Ah, whether or not 60 frames per second is discrete is up, up to you to decide. But then we move into the real world where it's obviously continuous, right? Now, I'm not saying that, you know, moving from chess to backgammon because this is now stochastic means that backgammon is necessarily harder than chess. But what I'm saying is if you take the same problem that's deterministic and then change it to be stochastic, the stochastic version will be more difficult to solve. If you have a fully observable game and then you hide some of the information, that partially observable version of the game will be harder to write an algorithm to solve. All right. That's it. That's what we have for today. So I understand that that was a lot of information. Try not to worry too much. You have the whole term or at least half the term until the midterm to study that. Okay. And all of those properties, they're pretty intuitive. You know what they mean. If I say what's partially observable, you could answer that right now. That's not something you really have to study. Um, on an exam, I might say, uh, you know, calculate the state space of tic-tac-toe calculate the state space of checkers or something like that, or like an upper bound for something like that. So um, those are going to be exam type questions uh, for that. And also, not only is this just memorizing for an exam, but like these properties are literally what determine the type of algorithm that you can use to solve the problem. So um, if an employer says, hey, um, We've got this problem. The first thing you do, the first thing you do is write down these properties of that environment or that game or that problem. And then you look up, okay, what type of algorithm can be applied to solve that problem? That's the, that's the very first step. I got a question here. Why is StarCraft discrete again? So StarCraft is discrete because technically inside the computer, the game is operating at 60 frames per second, right? So chess, you might have one frame every minute, right? I take a move, think for a minute, take another move, think for a minute. And so in, Ch in StarCraft, that minute between move technically now is 16 milliseconds, right? Because there's 60 frames a second, 1,000 divided by 60 is 16 approximately. So it's technically, if you want to be correct, StarCraft is discrete. So yes, someone just asked, all video games, all board games are technically discrete, but like real world volleyball is continuous, right? As long as the universe is continuous, for some definition of continuous, volleyball, soccer would be a continuous game, right? What I was trying to say before is that maybe you make some sort of distinction of like, how small a time step has to be for you to consider it a continuous problem. And so if you're, if you come up with some definition that says, okay, a continuous environment is one in which you have to make a decision more frequently than once every 20 milliseconds, then I guess StarCraft will be a continuous game. But technically speaking, if it can be played in a computer, it is a, well, if it can be played in a digital computer, it is a discrete environment for the purposes of this course at least and exam and answering exam questions um 
yeah, that's about it. I don't see any further questions. So let me go back here. Um, on Tuesday, I am going to be bringing up assignment one. We are jumping right into assignment one. It's going to get us used to JavaScript. I'm going to show you the really cool environment that we have that we're going to be doing our assignments in. And I think you'll have a lot of fun with it. Um, just be aware that since the last class, uh, I'm not sure if I mentioned this, but each of the classes, um, the lectures are available on YouTube. So you can click this link to go to the YouTube video. The PDF slides are hosted on our university's uh, D2L or our Brightspace shell. So only students can get access to the physical slide or I guess the, the virtual slides to study with and a downloadable version. If you want to download the video, if you don't like watching it on YouTube, uh, a downloadable video is watchable on D2L. So you can go to D2L. So for example, here, if I click this, um, I'm logged into that. I can see that lecture and down here somewhere, uh, somewhere on this page is a download button. I think lecture videos, I think you can download it if you want to, but you can also watch it on D2L if you want. And that's a change I made since last time. Um, instead of hosting them on my website, they're hosted on, on D2L as well. So thank you very much. That's all for us until next week. So I hope you all have a great weekend and I'll see you on Tuesday.